Welcome to Friendly Words, the sermon podcast of Pratt Friends Church in Pratt, Kansas. The message you're about to hear was originally preached at Pratt Friends Church on Sunday, October 3rd, 2021. It focuses on the final hours of Jesus' life. The message to all who will listen is Jesus' sacrifice pays the price for our salvation. Now, here is Pastor Mike Neifert. Let's pray together. God, thanks for your word, and I know that you're going to accomplish what you desire because you've promised in your word that you're going to do that. And so I pray that your spirit today would guide us and speak to us and train us and correct us and rebuke us, and God, that we would be thankful people when we're done as we remember your cross. In Jesus' name, amen. It was hard for me to figure out how to start this message because nothing in my life experience comes anywhere close to what Jesus suffered on the cross. I have been spanked for things I did wrong, but I have not been flogged. I have been pricked by a thorn or two while trimming locust trees, but I've never had a crown of thorns pressed into my forehead. I stepped on sharp objects, goat heads mostly, but not had nails driven through my hands and feet. If I talk about the pain that I've experienced, none of it compares with what Jesus endured. All the cuts and bruises and tears and sprains and cramps and jabs, they're nothing. To mention them in the same sentence as Jesus' sufferings is ludicrous. I could whine about this or that injury or talk about post-surgery pain, and Jesus would just come back with, but did you die? Now, please don't misunderstand. Jesus cares about the pain that we go through. He invites us to pray about our anxieties and injuries and difficulties. We are to cast all of them on him because he cares for us, and he offers peace to those who will trust in him through the middle of all these things. I'm simply saying that the things that I've been through are pretty trivial compared to the things that Jesus went through for me, and I have no life experience that can touch this. None of us do. Jesus died for me, and I'm thankful. I know that you are too, and I encourage you to give thanks this morning as we walk through Jesus' final hours before the cross. I urge you to listen soberly and with humility to the words that Matthew reports. It is sin, your sin, my sin, Adam's sin, all of our sin, which necessitated the horrific events that are described at the end of Matthew chapter 27. So we're going to start with the first pain inflicted upon Jesus after Pilate's decision to give in to the crowd's demand for blood. Before Jesus leaves the governor's palace, the cruelty begins. To make sure that we're not going to leave anything out, we're going to reread a verse that we covered last week and continue on through the first bit of new content in chapter 27. We're going to start out with a short reading, just six verses. We're starting with verses 26 through 31. And if you have a Bible with you, I encourage you to follow along. Verse 26, then Pilate released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, is among the most difficult films to watch that I've ever seen. The depiction of Jesus' suffering in his last hours is gruesome and bloody, The minutes dedicated to bringing the part of the narrative that we just read to life are horrible, horrifying. The half-crazy guards laugh as they shred our Savior's back with whips designed to do maximum damage. By the end of the sequence, all standing nearby are covered in splattered blood, and the pavement across which they drag Jesus is wet with it. I don't know whether Gibson's portrayal of the cruelty of Rome is accurate, 
Some say it goes too far that the instruments of torture depicted were not commonly used prior to crucifixion. Others say that it doesn't go far enough and that the scene is too tame, that the beating wasn't made as ugly as reality would have been. I'm no expert. I only know that I was deeply moved as I watched. I wept over what Jesus endured for me. I think I would have done so if it was only half as awful. (laughs) We read the words flogged, stripped, thorns, struck, mocked, easily. They're just words to us. We forget that these words mean something. To the first century audience, Matthew's first readers, they spoke volumes. They'd seen floggings. They knew the thorns that were written about. They could imagine the beating Jesus received as the account was read to them. They were likely moved even more deeply than any of us are. Sometimes, at a football stadium or in a concert hall, when some terrible event has taken place during the week, those gathered are asked to observe a minute of silence to honor those affected by the happening. I think 60 seconds of contemplation, if not more, is called for every time we come to a retelling of the suffering of our Savior in his final hours. If you would, please pause with me and remember Christ's sacrifice. Reread the verses that we just read if you'd like. Seek God for understanding of what Jesus went through for you. Thank him for his great love, which made a way for us to be saved from God's wrath. One minute of silence to remember the flogging, the beatings, the thorns pressed into his head, the mockery, the spit. You would take your communion, tear off just the top layer. Let's remember together the broken body of Christ. Those who are participating, you have the bread. Let's give thanks to God for the sacrifice of Christ's body for us. Eyes on Jesus. Eyes on Jesus. Pure and holy, free from sin, keep your gaze steady, don't let it waver, eyes on the one who died for men, keep your gaze steady, don't let it waver, eyes on the Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. We have more to read. Jesus' journey toward the tomb is not yet complete. Hear now the words given to us in Matthew twenty-seven thirty-two through 40. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lot, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews." Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. 
Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. How long did Jesus hang on the cross? Hours. The early hours were filled with excruciating pain, nails piercing skin, weight pulling on wounds, breathing becoming more and more difficult. On top of the physical pain, those surrounding him piled on verbal abuse. Jesus was ridiculed by complete strangers who happened by. They threw his prophetic words about death and resurrection back in his face, not knowing he would fulfill them on the third day. He was insulted by the chief priests who had conspired against him and successfully petitioned the Roman governor to bring about his death. They spoke disparagingly of his ability to save himself and others. Even the two condemned men on either side of him joined in the mockery, adding insult to injury. It's hard to imagine how these words added to the agony of Jesus' slow and painful death. One without the other was bad enough. Both together would have been nearly unbearable. Those were the first hours. Then came the darkness. For three hours, from noon until three, the sun failed to light the scene. How God brought that about, I do not know, but I know that it happened. Whatever the cause, we know that at the end of this dark period, Jesus felt utterly alone, rejected by God, and he cries out these famous words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Are there any words more terrible than that? If, as many believed, the father had in reality turned his back on his son as sin was laid upon his son's shoulders, how alien this would have felt. From eternity past, father, son, spirit had always been one. Their relationship within the God had unbroken, and now, if only for a moment, there is a sort of separation. Again, I don't know how this worked or if we have it exactly right. I only know that in this moment, Jesus experienced abandonment for the first time in forever. His anguish must have been greater than we can even imagine. He was, by the Father's will, bearing the guilt of all sin alone. Moments later, after the brief interlude that, where someone offered him wine vinegar to drink, Jesus cried out again and he died. God's son's life as a human comes to a tragic end, or so it seems. No one at the cross that day imagined any good coming from what they had witnessed. Jesus' dying was to them completely and utterly pointless, senseless, and unfair. There's an interesting turn of phrase here, though. Verse 50 says, Jesus gave up his spirit. These words hint at his control over his own death. He was in charge. He was carrying out God's plan. When you look at Jesus suffering on the cross, experiencing God's absence, giving up his spirit, you can rejoice. What you're watching unfold is God's son paying the price for sin so that you could be saved and so that you don't have to be separated from God forever. All who believe are saved. This death is not pointless. It is not senseless. It is the death that matters most because in the end, it ends the reign of death and sin and ushers in this new era, an era of reconciliation between God and mankind. What Adam's sin ruined, our perfect fellowship with God is now restored. We can be in relationship with God because Jesus died in our place. He gave up his spirit so that we could have eternal life. Let us pause for a minute again to remember this great thing which God accomplished on the cross. Remember and give thanks 
Reread verses 32 to 50 during this time of quiet reflection if you like. Thank God for what Christ went through on your behalf. Praise him for the gift of salvation. We remember now the spilled blood of Christ. Those who are participating and have juice, you may take it and drink of it, remembering Christ and giving thanks to the one who died on our behalf. Eyes on Jesus, eyes on Jesus, who for joy For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Read with me now the next verses in Matthew chapter 27. Verses 51 to 54 tell us more about the greatness of the one who died for us. Listen to what happens after Jesus dies, after he gives up his spirit, and what the witnesses to his death say of him. There's truth here, so hear it. Starting at verse 51, At that moment the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. I think it's safe to say that no other death has ever affected the unseen spiritual realm, the seen earthly domain, and the seemingly permanent grave like this one did. The curtain of the temple, which only a single priest could go behind at appointed times and only if he had the blood of a sacrifice with him, represented separation between God and man, which existed because of sin. When Jesus died, it was torn in two, ripped up top to bottom. The earth shook at Jesus' death. All of creation was under a curse because of sin, and the ground was cursed because of Adam because Adam chose his way over God's. But the curse is reversed. When Jesus died for sin, the earth knew it. The curse will finally and completely be ended when Jesus comes again and makes all things new for eternity. And what's all this about tombs breaking open and dead people running around the city? Is there any clear indication outside of Jesus' own resurrection, which is a couple days away, that death is defeated? Jesus wins the victory over death in his death. Adam received this command and warning from God. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. When Adam and Eve took this forbidden fruit and ate it, death entered into the world. All those born of Adam would die. This was the punishment for breaking this one commandment. Jesus, the innocent, sinless Son of God, dying and then rising from the dead, broke the cycle. 
Death is no longer the end for those whose faith is in Jesus. Eternal life is the believer's destiny. I love how the Roman commander who knows nothing of the cosmic implications of what's unfolding before him comes to the logical conclusion. This guy is the son of God. Our Savior is the Son of God, and he has broken sin's curse. Another minute of reflection or response seems appropriate here. A minute of worship, a minute in awe of Jesus, the King of Kings. Reread verses 51 to 54 if you like. Thank God that he, in love, came to rescue us. Bow in submission to the one whose rule you have chosen, the conqueror of death. We reflect now on the power of God's Son to save. Let's open our hands and look to the heavens in thanksgiving. Eyes on Jesus, eyes on Jesus. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's read the rest of Matthew 27 now. Verses 55 through 66 bring Jesus to the end of his journey to the tomb. Starting at verse 55, many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As the evening approached, there came a man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of a rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. For most every human, this would be the end of their story. No more narrative, no more chapters. But there is a Matthew 28. In that chapter, what the chief priests and Pharisees did becomes utterly foolish. Guard the tomb? How is a little seal going to stop the resurrection? Can a handful of men, even if they're armed to the teeth, keep God's son in the grave? It's laughable to think that anything or anyone could stop what God had ordained. Jesus reported repeatedly throughout his gospel account Jesus' words concerning what was coming after his death. Hear them. 
This is what Matthew gave us in chapter 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And then here's what Matthew wrote in chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. Here's more. Here are Matthew's words in chapter 20, verses 17 to 19. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the twelve aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Jesus is, as predicted, in the tomb after dying at the hands of the religious folks. Check that box. The third day is coming. Get ready to check another one. The disciples have forgotten his words, it seems. The chief priests and elders, though, they remember what he said. Early in the morning on the first day of the week, their reactions are going to reverse. The disciples are going to rejoice, and these leaders are going to mourn. My friends, let's pause once more. I invite you now for one minute to rejoice in the salvation that Jesus' death bought and celebrate this new life that is ours because of Jesus' resurrection. We have victory in Jesus because he is alive. Eyes on Jesus, eyes on Jesus, the crucified one who rose again. Keep your gaze steady, don't let it waver. Eyes on the one who lives in there. Keep your gaze steady. We close now with the same words we've closed with for the last three or four weeks from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. We're going to pull it all together. Let these words encourage you as you go out to serve Jesus this week. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this time to worship you and to honor your son today. We thank you for your spirit's presence to bring your word powerfully into our hearts. I pray, Father, that as we go from this place, as we continue to worship you throughout this week, that our hearts would be filled with a desire for others to know you, that you would send out workers into your harvest field. Help us wherever we are, whatever we're doing, to be a blessing to those around us. 
and to shine our lights so that men can see our good deeds, the ones that you empower us to do, that you created us to do, and that they might praise you, our Father in heaven. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you have been encouraged and challenged by today's sermon. If you want to hear each week's message, be sure to subscribe to Friendly Words in your podcast app. May God bless you as you follow Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit.